Hello and a very warm welcome to everyone. I am Shrija Agrawal and you are watching our series Winning with Anti-Fragility. In today's dispatch, we double down on the theme building anti-fragility through culture and leadership. Before we deep dive in this August panel, let's do some context setting for the same. Anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. The resilient resists shocks and stays the same. The anti-fragile gets better, said Nassim Nicholas Talib. Talib wrote this in his 2002 seminal book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From Disorder. And he opined that the system would be better in quality, competence, and capability as a result of shock, volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors. The precarious ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic induced India's socioeconomic landscape to be recalibrated in an unprecedented manner and at an urgent pace. What organizations need right now is some form of stability that tends to cost a great deal. Change alters and disrupts norms of the status quo and business as usual, with the fallen performance and has the potential to make corporations flounder. One source of this disruption is a corporate culture that is constantly affected by factors including family, lives of the employees, workplace interactions that are now remote, religion, the economy, and politics. Of course, enterprises have stringent and predetermined expectations for how workplace behavior must be, especially now with telecommuting being a new norm. But many say that this makes them too vulnerable and too fragile for when change ensues. If corporations were anti-fragile, they could potentially undergo a new stable workforce with improved innovation, product quality, and service performance. As Talib said, the wind extinguishes a candle and energizes fire. You want to be the fire and wish for the wind. So what must leaders really do to be the fire? Could corporations be crafted to react positively to cultural change? In lieu of consistency, what if corporations focused on learning continuously, adapting and being mindful? Would they thrive? And if they did that, how would they do that? How would their reputation and their retention be maintained? What do leaders need to do to get there? To break it all down, I have with me a very meaningful panel. Please help me welcome Sulil Shroff, Managing Partner, Sulil Mitchell Mangaldas, Anjali Bansal, Founder of Wana Capital, Vineet Nair, Founder, Chairperson, and CEO of Sampar Foundation, former CEO of HCF Technologies. It's my sheer pleasure and privilege to welcome all of you to be winning with anti fragility and what a panel we have today. I'll uh, begin with you, Mr. Shroff, in sort of no particular order, just to sort of some context setting here and taking it further from what I just spoke. Talib famously said, the worst possible organization is an organization that has absolutely no problems ever. Now, with the advent of growing stressors that we have seen during this pandemic, what in your mind truly constitutes a bad organization, the perspective of its corporate culture, and what really constitutes an anti-fragile organization? Thanks, Shuja, and that's a terrific question. So, uh, Roosevelt uh, once famously said, that a smooth sea never a skilled sailor made. Uh, and that's so true. And it is only in rough seas that the true skills uh, of an expert captain uh, can be forged. Uh, in my own firm, one of my favorite uh, sayings, which I often share with uh, my partners and with the organization, is that a leader really needs to be like Shiva. You need to have the ability to drink an ounce of poison every day. Uh, it's very good for the health of a leader. Uh, and that's exactly what happens to you when you're leading a large and uh, complex organization. Every day something is uh, thrown at you and you become stronger as a result of this. But there are some leaders who also collapse uh, and they, they don't survive. But there are lots of examples where they actually get better and better. So I completely agree with Talib's ob uh, observation that an organization which doesn't have problems or can't face problems is the worst sort of organization. And it's hard to sort of be very binary about it of good organizations and bad organizations. But good organizations and that survive in the long term are those which build this muscle. Uh, at, the, at the least, at the baseline, it is a muscle of resilience. But at its best, I think it is a muscle of anti-fragility where you actually face a crisis and thrive from it. Uh, and in our own case, I've seen this uh, very often, you know, whether it's six years ago uh, when the firm split, we are a much better firm today. 
uh, and we thrived on it and the opportunities that came uh, out, are arising from it are uh, uh, are amazing or even how uh, you know not only my firm but several similar organizations have faced the uh, uh, faced the pandemic i think we have, if you faced it with uh, a mindset of that there is an opportunity in this crisis uh, you come out uh, much better so my advice i mean to answer for a question of what should be the mindset i think the mindset should be of uh, two things uh, to use a cliche uh, never waste a good crisis i think the amount of stuff that you can get done uh, when there is a crisis which you would find otherwise very difficult in normal times the crisis is the best time to get it done whether you want to get rid of underperformance whether you want to sharpen your strategy uh, whether you want to open sort of new things which you would have taken longer to get sort of consensus around when a crisis comes just strike when the iron is hot at that stage is very easy to create consensus so you always have to see look at things with the mindset of crisis of course i have to deal with it but there is an opportunity over here and if you have that kind of a mindset then i think you certainly come out uh, much stronger at the end of it and i am one of the firm believers it and a lot of the role models that i personally have in life uh, have been those who have approached uh, uh, crisis uh, with this sense of opportunity rather than with a sense of fear of course you know uh, leaders are also human beings they have fear uh, but they can't show it and they have to uh, uh, take their organization along with uh, with confidence and with a sense of not only are we going to face it but we are going to beat it so that's how uh, i've seen you know how leadership and crisis uh, work together okay thanks for that mr shraw i come to you now vineet we just heard what he said in terms of saying that you know the leader is essentially like shiva to drink an ounce of poison sort of every day and you more stronger with it and uh, you also use the analogy of a muscle that at the base level case it's like a muscle you tear from it and you more stronger but it's also about the best levels become anti fragile in your sort of experience of running an organization a large organization in your past life and what you're doing with some park now and this entire involvement that you have very closely with so many boards and leadership if i were to ask you for your opening two or three ideas on what really constitutes an anti fragile organization what would that really be yeah so uh, to begin with uh, you know i'm not necessarily in agreement with everything that sheryl said which is which is very rare but in this case uh, there is a slight difference of opinion and let me set the context for that i think uh, when the industrial age came in uh the management mantras were defined about uh aligning people in rows and columns and getting 10 times more than what they potentially can do on their own and therefore uh all these pyramid structures and leader on the top and employee at the bottom you know all those philosophies and theories uh came in where leader was the god and leader would show the show the way and as shirl said leader should not show fear so he's this macho man or this wonder woman who everybody looks up to and that in the industrial age was very very successful and those leaders were very successful those organizations were very successful but as the digital age came in uh, interestingly more and more people realized that the value creation in an organization and response to a threat uh, in the organization whether it happened at y2k or the dot com bust or the recent covid cycle uh is largely around innovation around the digital innovation around innovation so the management thinkers started asking the question in terms of okay how do i create an innovative organization if the response to crisis is in innovation so where i agree with shirl is that the response is to search for opportunities in crisis right the question is how do you search for opportunities in crisis you search them by innovating then the management thinkers started thinking is what is innovation how do you build the culture of innovation since we are extensively talking about culture and how do you create an organization where not just one person mark zuckerberg but everybody in the organization innovates because when it is crisis you know for example you are rowing in a still water and suddenly the the water becomes choppy and when it becomes choppy then you have to 
play by the rules of river rafting, where every single person intuitively knows what the other person wants. So there's no one leader, every, because you cannot hear a leader, and every single person is rowing based on the opportunities or the threats they see, and everybody is rowing in tandem. You don't have the same strengths of communication which you had when everything was quiet and the leader was telling left, right, left, right. Say, so that's not happening. So how do you create this culture where an organization can row uh, with no communication from the top and, and they get through the crisis? And there is where the periphery innovation organizations started coming in, in terms of organizations which, which innovate on the periphery. And there is where, even when I wrote the book, Employees First, Customer Second, the ethos of that was that the time has come. If you want to create an innovative organization, you have to invert the organization pyramid and make the management accountable and responsible to the employees because the true value is created by the employees. So the only role manager and management should play is to infuse, encourage, enable those employees to create differentiated innovation, differentiated value, differentiated experience so that the organization grows more faster. So when we talk about creating a culture which is anti-fragile, we can only create it when we move from one hero to many heroes, from one decision maker to many decision makers, from one waiting for communication to not waiting for communicating and intuitively acting on it. The only way out of a crisis is quick action. Move forward, move forward, keep, 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 don't, don't, don't put your horse down, keep moving forward. So that's the first aspect uh, of what is important for us. The second aspect, which is very interesting, is the issue of inspiration. Organizations uh, which have been created in the 70s and 80s and some very ex extremely successful uh, organizations in India and abroad were created on inspiring individuals like Cheryl Sayer. And, and these individuals had a vision and many people joined them in that vision and that's how the organization here got created. The startup organizations today are not created by one individual. It is created by a group of people, right? A group of people coming together and, and coming and, and disrupting and, and trying to innovate in a different way. And what inspires them is the vision of doing something which nobody else has done before. So the vision of doing the impossible. So anti-fragility culture in those startups, and I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more, does not get built on response to a certain threat. It is COVID today, it will be something else tomorrow. But the excitement of climbing Mount Everest, and therefore when you are excited about climbing Mount Everest, whatever little challenge you face on the, on the way appears smaller than it is. And therefore that would be my second opening remark in terms of, if you want to build a culture of anti-fragility, not only you need to invert the organization and make employees first and customers second, but also you need to think about what is the inspiration of the organization? What is the bigger purpose of the organization? What is the bigger goal of the organization? So that all crisis looks small because the purpose is much larger than the crisis. I think thanks for that, Vineet. And uh, thanks for what Mr. Shroff also said. You know, I'm seeing both the themes playing out. I have interviewed more than 1,000 founders now in my career, spanning about 10 to 11 years covering private markets. And uh, we saw waves of, especially the startup founders that you mentioned, where there's so much of this holy cow and halo culture around the founder. And there's so much of romanticism of dressing like a Steve Jobs or talking like a Jeff Bezos, that, it's just un that we are still seeing that. That is one which definitely still exists and many more in startups. Our Ola will always be about Harbish. Our Flipkart will always be about Sachin and Bini. Now, of course, there's a change in management. But look at ourselves and our daily balance of communication. We tend to associate startups with the founders. In fact, investors will often and often tell you that we are backing founder first company later. The companies pivot. The products pivot, but we back the founders. That is one we are definitely seeing. But to your point on the decentralization of power is extremely well taken, and we are definitely seeing that. In fact, I think that I would also go to the extent of saying this, that the biggest disruption that's happened in the last 10 years is that how organizations are being managed through projects. 
and i'm seeing that in a big way including my organization and the others that i speak with especially in unicorns where i'm often told that this is the project through which they are projects which companies and organizations are betting on top 3 and top 4 projects and to your point there's absolutely decentralization of power happening in those areas where you have a cto or a chief product officer or two three smart agile teams coming as problem solver teams and getting on the problem so that really sets the stage uh, very well for our opening remarks and i know i would like to bring the lady on the panel with them watching and listening to both the men very patiently until you in and as a great segue to really my next question on this entire idea of decentralization of power anjali uh, i mean you led spencer stewart in your past life then you were a pre senior role at tpg and now you are running avana capital so you have led teams you have seen organizations from up close my question to you really is that when decentralization of power happens where teams are given resources and power allowing them more autonomy to have this change how could effective leadership be inculcated in such frameworks i mean what really is the exact framework to make that work and would such decentralization be a realistic and a feasible goal in the long run for organizations let me ask you this especially we're talking about it's one thing to do a pop on the stock market being a consumer internet company but the proof of the pudding really is to sustain that that's what we are asking how do you sustain anti fragility so my question to you is that and that especially for more tech and new age companies yeah thank you shrija since you started with a pop on the stock market i think i'll let me quote a statistic <laughs> the average age of a company on the s&p 500 over the last 50 years so in 1965 it was 33 years in 2027 it is expected to be 12 years in the last decade alone we've had a total to sort of turnover of 50% of the s&p companies weren't on s&p 500 10 years ago what that means is capital markets are not just about a pop listing may have a pop but capital markets are actually quite smart and over a period of time uh, what it does find its own level Uh, in every situation whether it is a new listing or it is an old listing the second point i want to make is today well crisis is not a momentary or a point in time matter crisis is every because crisis and opportunity what is crisis crisis you know disruption is a crisis digitization is a crisis for an old economy company change in regulation is a crisis right so when take for example when gst came in informal unorganized big crisis for them but overall very good for the economy right so i would even go so far as to say that today crisis is every day crisis management is an everyday thing we are living in a buka world whether you are a startup or a big company every leader is thinking about what can the disruptors will get disrupted so what is going to be an opportunity for my business or organization and what is going to be a threat uh, let me take cyril's analogy a little bit here see there there was a time when in manthan you know when manthan happened it was a sequential process first the poison came out first wish came out then amrit came out today every day there is wish and amrit but in order to get to the amrit you have to go through the wish so you have to get to taste that the nectar you have to go through the poison the job of leadership is to absorb the poison so to your point decentralization would i would actually say it is not as much decentralization but it is distribution it is a very much an internet era right you cannot have concentrated centers of either knowledge or information or enhanced decision making you have to be able to enable a lot of the information actually today a lot of the information is bottom up not top down so to remove the role of leaders is to remove asymmetry of information as much as possible uh to create distributed leaders across the organization and that old model of well you know you had to be in a company for 30 years to be a leader is no longer true our unicorns today we call them startups but they are actually very big companies they are systemically important parts of our economy today they may be young in age but they are large they are important and consequently you'll see them functioning like any large company without actually losing their agility so when we talk about anti fragility i want to focus on the agility what makes it less fragile is actually flexibility 
palm trees don't break in strong winds because they are flexible and so organizations whether they're a tall organization or a short organization have to stay flexible role of leaders delegate empower enable stay very humble recruit retain motivate inspire get out of the way okay uh that's sort of uh, well said anjali and i sort of uh, now want to expand the entire narrative that we're talking about here uh we spoke about the leader compared it to shiva you will get to the nectar after drinking the poison we spoke about decentralization of power distribution of power the average age of founders coming down the fact that now we have unicorns as anjali mentioned that systemically very important to india's economy and wealth But the question really is that some way we also have this obsession with the founder's age, and I'm increasingly seeing that uh, this uh, entire attitude towards a founder being that old person in the organization and something expected. I think I think that imagery is definitely going away. When the change in management happens, and that's also a very important question to ask now. we have organizations going through transition uh, i have heard these stories from a lot of promoters who have these major questions on their mind that will the young generation be really be able to take the reins of the organization handle it and perhaps sustain and maintain the antifragility that they have been able to capture throughout the years and one of the reasons is this is why perhaps mnas also happen one of the big reasons feminism is also this so my question to this august panel is that what makes a good founder and a sense a good leader and what's the distinction to be made by leaders that would create enterprises that are built to last versus enterprises that are built to sell i mean so founders mindset one can understand you have a built to last mindset or you have a built to sell mindset there's nothing wrong with both the mindsets I don't think any of us are providing any kind of value judgment here, but what is the difference in the founders' mindset when you're talking about both these paradigms? Uh, I'll begin with you, Mr. Shroff, then on to Vinit, and then Anshi. Yeah. So thanks. It's a it's a very uh, deep question that runs uh, sort of addresses not only uh, how leaders and founders run their organization day to day, but one of the most important challenges that. every leader and founder will face at some point of time or the other which is that of succession uh, and it 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 has many uh, many aspects but one of them of course uh, also is not only how will the process be managed but how does it relate to your uh, your sort of core mentality is it a built to last mindset or is it a uh, built to a sell mindset and there are different different types of leaders and it's very contextual so churchill was a fantastic uh, uh, war time leader but after the war uh, the uk public did not uh, reelect him because he was not the right leader for that context so the uh, the 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 way things are changing and the uh, leadership skills that are required uh, as the world is moving so fast and i think the world has moved in the last 20 years probably what at the pace that it didn't move for the last many many centuries so at this pace uh, the leadership skills that are required are vastly different uh, not only do you require uh, a speed agility flexibility everything that we just kind of discussed uh, as well and the ability to see around corners i think the ability to see around corners is one of the greatest and to have a vision about it i think is very important uh, it says they say you know it's the art of seeing the invisible uh that is one of the most important things that uh, that the future leaders uh, will bring to bear now that being said i think one of the things which uh, i have noticed time after time is that every generation overestimates itself and underestimates the next generation they always think that they are going to prove the old generation wrong uh in terms of uh really how they adapt because the circumstances are different the skill sets are different uh and the time make it the man and the the the, the leader uh, leader or leaders and the model uh, emerges 
what that next model is going to be for the world of leadership i think we don't know we are all only speculating we are just sort of going by past experience and maybe even what we are all currently going through now in a world which is going to see so much change in the and crisis starting with climate change which is existential we may all be sitting in drowning cities uh, it could be uh, it could be the impact of technology it could be the sort of impact of uh, deglobalization and all these factors the future leader is going to have to deal with all of this we haven't had to deal with it uh, we only sometimes like sitting in bombay have a part of the city drowning uh, for a for a few weeks or for a few days can you think of 20 30 years from now the kind of crisis that a future leader will have to deal with so uh, when one looks at it from a built to last perspective i think you really have to think about the ability of a leader or a set of leader every generation to pivot to the circumstances as they change from time to time and we should not underestimate uh, the future uh, i think ultimately the answer is only this because everything else will change the people will change your business may change everything may change the only thing that should not change is your purpose and your values if an organization is founded on the right set of principles and core ethics and core values and it has a sense of the purpose of what it is i think it will survive everything it's only when organizations go wrong on their core purpose or on their core values that they lose their way and then they disappear which is why only a certain subset of organizations really last and those that last always have had very great clarity in terms of what their purpose and values are so i think it is about really making sure that as you uh, look at an organization which is built to last or built to sell i think the real difference both are going to create value the only difference between the two is the value system the sense of purpose long term purpose uh and whether the values and the purpose are properly aligned or not if you have a mindset only of quarter to quarter uh you are going to behave in a particular way whereas if you have a mindset of a multi you know multi decade i won't say multi generational this is multi decade organization your mindset uh, is necessarily different you will uh, behave in a very different uh, kind of way that is the difference and unfortunately the way our capital markets work uh it is inherently biased in favor of uh, a short term approach and there are big changes that are coming as you know uh, there are regulatory changes around the corner uh which are going to do away with the concept of a promoter now a concept of a promoter doesn't exist in so many parts of the world the one of the reasons why uh, indian business has had a long term mindset is because of the concept of a promoter and it's a good and it, the concept has both good and bad i'm not sitting in judgment but once you take that out of the equation and you act to it the fact that today's organizations are you know with small founder holdings essentially a short business cycle 12 years or less or whatever it is yeah you know we're getting into uncharted territory of uh, probably a bias towards short termism as compared to uh, long termism and it's going to be very difficult for organizations to keep that long term mindset uh hanging the peg only on a value system but it's also very interesting okay it actually open okay i would like to sort of uh, bring you vinith in and just taking it further from what mr shrob just said that you know he spoke about the various challenges that uh, perhaps the future generations will have to see which perhaps the generation of yours did not necessarily have to foresee and of course at the heart of it really is uh, the entire environment and climate changes in fact uh, the entire covid-19 is nothing but the fact that we have been jolted out of our black swan blindness all this while we behaved as if these black swan events don't occur abnormalities don't occur and what really has this covid-19 shown to business leaders is has basically changed the meaning of risk forever how do you measure risk has changed forever now uh, i want to understand and if you were to answer me that okay shrija the straight answer to this direct question to you how will the future leader look like three aspects of that future leader three traits of that future leader what should the future leader really have and i ask you this given you are somebody who has been credited so much with what you did with hcr as a very effective leader so what do you think a future leader should have in him or her yeah before i go there i need to register a very strong protest 
on what you said, and I take a very strong exception uh, to the fact that you did not consider me as a future generation. So my, <laughs> my friend, <laughs> oh, Can you just say that? Please do not try. What do you think out? Ah, Cheryl, and, <laughs> and we, you know, we should not accept uh, such such comments. Uh, you know, I we, did we not have a lot of muscle, <laughs> and there is a lot of dumb left. So, <laughs> uh, we are value creators. No, so that's yeah, uh, that's yeah. on the human side. I think uh, you know this is a very interesting question in terms of uh, uh, what does the future leader look like, and I uh, I have been invited to talk to IMA, which is the Indian Mil Military Academy, to the cadets mm -hmm. and talk to them on 24th of uh, September. And uh, today morning, when I was writing that this note, uh, I said that the next general of Indian Army is going to be. Uh, who is going to be in the room is going to be a general in about 1950 to 1960, right? So therefore, uh, if he in in 2020, what do I say to him, which would be relevant for him as a leader? So what should the leader be? So you know, suddenly when you move away from corporate and you move into a completely different domain like an army, you do not think about five, ten years. You think about 30, 40 years. Yeah. Yeah. One thing which really stands out, so your your three things, one thing which really stands out is that in the army of tomorrow and therefore in the organization of tomorrow, nobody will be managed. Everybody will be led. So the leader is one of the many. So you were rightly said when the opening remark that we have a huge amount of halo around, around Mr. This and Miss This and you know your newspapers have done a lot of uh, this service on publishing photographs and selling them. So therefore, we created the hellos as, as if they are the only people who are responsible, including my photographs. So, you know, they are the only people who are responsible. So I think that hello is going to go away predominantly because people do not want to be managed. And that trend is only going to increase. And therefore, they need to be inspired. They need to be led. They need to be mentored. They need to be guided. And the only reason an Indian army, you know, we are we're talking a lot about Vikram Batra these days, that the only reason Indian army succeeds is young officers behave like soldiers and are first out of the trench and the last back from the battle. Now, that is the leadership style of tomorrow. And that leadership style has to sustain right up to the CEO level, right up to uh, how you go up. So that's the first thing that the world of management and the world of managing, the world of counting is dead, and the world of creating, the world of mentoring, the world of inspiring is going to get created. That's the first thing. The second thing is that leadership of tomorrow has to have a significant amount of humility uh, in them. I think this halo which you talked about is not just of me looking up to a leader, but yeah. is also this, this ego which comes into the leader and therefore, the humility goes up. Now, I know for a fact today, if I were to lead HCL technologies all over again, I can guarantee that there is very little I understand of the technologies of today. And therefore, I may have this hello of Vineet Nayar who was leading the HCL technology transformation. But if I were the CEO today, I know very little about technology. And therefore, I'm absolutely the wrong person to lead. So as you become obsolete, you need to understand. And it also reflects what Cheryl was saying that the founders also become obsolete. So once you become obsolete, the only way you will realize that your value add to the organization is limited is by having humility to understand that your capability is going to be sharp cutting edge for the organization for a limited period of time and you need to exit. And therefore the, ability, the humility is going to be very critical. The third, and I think, you know, we, we talked about right in the beginning, the third, aspect of any founder or any leader of tomorrow is going to define a vision of tomorrow which is so compelling that people will go up and want to climb Mount Everest for you every day. And that will only happen if the vision of tomorrow has two aspects. Number one, the purpose is clear. 
that the purpose is not profit, the purpose is not revenue, the purpose is not number one. The purpose is much, much bigger that we are changing the world, we are contributing the world, which is what this young, young generation need. And the second aspect of the vision is what is in it for everybody? You know, you're talking about these new gen companies. There are so many stories of these new gen companies behaving obnoxiously, sacking people, firing people in, in, in an in a inhuman way. And irrespective of their valuation, I, I call them vultures of today. They are not nation builders of today. So the leadership of tomorrow has to take everybody along, has to inspire everybody along, and has to define a vision which is inclusive of what is in it for you. All employees, all customers, all shareholders, what is in it for you? So if they are not inclusive leaders, and you must understand the trend towards increasing accountability was only with stock market with your profitable returns, no more. People are asking so your social responsibility, your ecological responsibility, your environmental responsibility, your ethical behavior responsibility. So the leaders of tomorrow cannot just be driven by capital market investors. They have to be driven by a larger purpose and an inclusive vision. So those three would be, I would say, critical for leaders of tomorrow. That's interesting and well said. Essentially, to be not managed, but to be led and you also have a leader which enunciates the vision of tomorrow so clearly that you have people to be able to ride the Mount Everest with you. And of course, not only to be guided by capital market gains, but you have other factors creeping in now. Uh, and I think there's an entire narrative to this that you are moving from shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. And your stakeholders include a variety of factors. It includes environment, people whom you work with, governance, and so on. I come to you now, Anjali. And uh, since it's a very interesting conversation, we deeper and deeper into it. Uh, to point of what Mr. Shroff and Neet also said, that uh, the culture is driven by the purpose. The purpose has to be very clear how long, long term you are into it. And that really is the core that defines, as a founder, if you're built to sell and built to last. Uh, my question to you really is that what we are seeing in a lot of startups in the new age companies right now is that you are there's a tendency to focus on short-term gains instead of long-term profits. And this generally is a reverse of anti-fragility framework. Now, the thing is, I don't blame them. They are on a constant pedestal because you have raised so much funding, you're answerable to your set of VCs, and you're also in the constant pursuit of raising you another round of funding, perhaps at a higher valuation. And to top, to top all of it, we are in an environment of super abundant capital. There's a huge FOMO playing out, both on the part of investors, plus on the side of the companies attracting capital. What if I'm soft bank today? What if a soft bank or Tiger Global invests money in my competition tomorrow? These are questions running in the minds of founders. So there are natural tendencies and very instinctive tendencies to perhaps prioritize short-term gains over long-term profits. In these kind of scenarios, how can one really remain anti-fragile? I want to ask you this uh, because the agility one of the founder in the capital environment that we're operating in is also very, very fast. There are deals happening at breakneck speed. So both, so there's a capital provider, which is so agile, and then there's a founder who wants to put up the game. So how do you be resilient and anti-fragile in, organ and in an environment like this? I want to understand from you. Prioritizing long-term over short-term. Great question, Shija. And I'm thinking, how do you define short term? And how do you define long term? Right? So when you think about multi-decadal organizations, and one of the I'm I'm very closely associated with the Tata Group. I have a huge sense of admiration for Unilever. And these are all businesses that have continuously reinvented, right? So they have stayed more or less at the cutting edge. They are massively respected. They attract great talent. They deliver good returns. And yet would they be the high performing organization that didn't keep an eye on the quarter to quarter earnings also so there is a holistic sense of what makes a successful organization so i want to rebut that a little bit it's not as simplistic as to say you can either be short term or be long term 
you actually have to be both right so long term is made up of a series of short terms isn't it now startups i think let's talk about startups particularly we are going through a fairly rich liquidity environment it is creating its own sense of a different type of dynamic today at the same time we are in a phase where we are in some ways very fortunate it has not been a better time ever to either be an entrepreneur or an investor i doubt because that, we have technology <laughs> we have great ideas as a country we have technology we have great ideas we have an amazing talent pool 10 years ago we could not got the kind of talent not just as founders but even coming to work in startups that we are able to get today that is true yeah so should we not capitalize on this convergence on this wonderful sort of convergence of factors and capitalize on that for good outcomes for not just the country but for the world you know what is happening in india today in the startup ecosystem is not for india alone it is for the world so that's one thing second thing is i think it is unfair really to compare five to the first five to seven years of a company's existence any company's existence remember the large companies of today were also startups once so what they have to do uh, and it is it is a difficult treadmill it's a lonely journey to be a founder i think the the founders are the bravest most courageous most amazing people out there not everybody succeeds we only know the unicorns today but for every unicorn there are many that didn't make it for a variety of reasons you know whatever and today maybe capital itself is a factor of success so whoever is able to raise capital so who are we to say that is good or bad you know one can say that too much capital going into very specific into a few opportunities actually stifles innovation in that space because once one player gets funded even if the other has a better model or a better technology they may not be able to attract capital right and so they may actually have a shorter shelf life but all of this said i do i'm i'm actually quite optimistic about both the near term medium term and definitely the long term because what are we seeing in a crisis like the covid pandemic which we have never seen before and we hope we never see again what what emerged two things emerged both of them are opportunities out of the crisis one is massive acceleration of digitization in not just india but around the world in segments and sectors so so consumer segments and sectors that were slow to digitize msmes bottom of the pyramid the further penetration of say digital payments acceleration of creating digital public digital infrastructure in india right so upi india stack we are now looking at ondc open network for digital commerce so we had an acceleration of digitization leading to more formal and hence more visible discoverable products services people companies had to pivot overnight so companies that were running on call centers realize that they don't need to have physical spaces right so all their people went home they created remote call centers virtual call centers and now there's a it's a permanent shift in the business model more efficient more innovative and frankly more inclusive because of this today you don't need to necessarily bring people to jobs you can take jobs to people in tier 2 tier 3 i have a i can't even tell you how many companies are facing this right now where their young people are not coming back they have moved back to their tier 2 tier 3 towns they are living with their parents or gone back to their families and they don't want to come back to a bombay delhi bangalore but eventually we will find the right hybrid mix but that's not happening immediately so i think there is the digitization has happened it has also alerted us to the very significant not just problem of sustainability to me sustainability for the next 20 years is going to be the next set of opportunities like digital was for the last 20 years sustainability will be for the next 20 there is enough work happening i think our regulator actually is very forward looking sebi has come out with the responsibility sustainability reporting so bs brsr which not just big companies but we are talking about it in act in our act ecosystem with with startups and saying how do you prepare yourself at the time of list you will need to be that so the integrated business models it's no longer enough to say well you can either be profitable or purposeful it's not a choice yeah. it has to be integrated business model there cannot be profit without purpose and purpose will be sustainable if it is profitable interesting so so there are interesting cocktail of challenges and i do think that we have to come to a situation to realize that there is definitely something called too much capital and to your point that too much capital stifles innovation and there is merit to that there's a recent cbin site study which said 
that a lot of companies in fact globally failed because they themselves the founders admitted of having raised too much capital very initially in fact there's an entire terminology called capital foie gras doing the rounds where vcs and large investors in the environment of super abundant capital are feeding capital down the throats of founders uh, so so while there's super abundant capital feeding down the founders is former playing out and then your large vcs uh, there's a entire thing in the us that a retail company shut down and you say oh, what happened you know we got amazon and similarly that analogy is with the vc world that what happened to your private company and i got soft banked you know my competition got funding from soft bank so capital definitely is a very big moat if you are very heavily funded there are chances you can market better you can recruit better you can hire best technology people so i often capital itself can decide the winners so to the founders who are really fearing and losing their sleep on my competitor being funded by a large vc there is merit to that and then of course there's environmental challenges and the most important amongst all of this which we haven't really spoken about i'm going to spend some 10 minutes on this is that nowhere have i seen earlier and i have seen this uh, you know play out 5 to 6 years back when i used to uh, speak with a lot of vc they used to say shrija you know what this company is becoming a global company now now they're going to be a global organization but the meaning of globalization and what does it truly really mean to be a global company now where uh, the entire covid-19 situation has surely shown especially what the us china equation is right now that is it truly really meaningful anymore to be a global company and i think uh, how do you sort of sustain anti fragility in that context where you have so many equations playing out at a nation level Uh, we have seen what happened in china with the recent clamp down and to technology companies there uh, so my question to this august panel really is that how has the definition of globalization changed with so much randomness disorder disunity and chaos uh, and i think uh, that's a great sort of conclusion to this uh, entire conversation that we had we spoke about so many aspects we should spend some time on startup sporting global ambitions it is not easy anymore yeah so i'll begin with you uh, mr shrav go on to me yeah so thanks uh, shrija actually a very difficult question because nobody really knows the answer to how this is going to shape up but uh, if i can just step back a couple of uh, um, sort of steps uh, when we talk of globalization we are really talking about global scale and access to global markets and i think you have to really think about in the new context of really what is the model that is being used to cover so many markets and essentially i think there are two styles that may be exaggerating a bit but i, I will in order to make the point uh, of how do you scale excellence uh, to that level and then what challenges does it cause uh the first model uh, without any kind of religious overtones i call it the christian model uh which is the model of the church now church is one of the uh, most complex and largest organizations in the world but by and large if you see all the churches in the world they are the same and the second model uh, is the buddhist model which is also a global religion but every temple buddhist temple in the world is different uh and but they have a set of guardrails there will be a set of guardrails which you follow because that allows you to uh, adapt to different uh different markets and different organizations so mcdonalds would be a very good example of the church model but even the great mcdonalds had to make aloo tikki in india uh in order to uh to sort of cater to so while there these two broad models of global excellence which will pursue local factors are going to make a very big difference uh and consequently the ability of uh organizations when they have global since we're talking about globalization to maintain their essence and at the same time be locally adaptable is going to be very important i would put my money on Uh, a, a, a Christian model with a big Buddhist exception, or a Buddhist model with a little bit of Christianity in it, uh, in order to arrive at the sort of right, uh, 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 right mix. 
but an organization which is very inflexible which is going to say no, i am going to make the same veg burger or you know, whatever chicken burger across the world will die because you are that is where you run into problems like different laws different tax regimes different compliance uh, frameworks different covid protocols uh, you know even in the same country in every state we have you know one of the most mind blowing things is just keeping track of the amount of covid notifications that come out every day how do you build an organization and how do you scale excellence where uh, there is so much so many moving pieces so uh, globalization uh, is going to be a tough challenge i think philosophically because of the manner in which uh, you know political thinking and social thinking has moved there has been a really a sort of an inward uh, movement where actually globalization has shrunk and we are going through a phase of deglobalization uh that doesn't mean that there will not be access to foreign markets so the leadership style for dealing with uh a global world which has got so many different forces at play would be as i said without any religious overtones to think of the buddhist way of uh of building an organization where you just have some basic guardrails and principles and then let the organization evolve differently and you know vinith has run a a global organization i think he will resonate with uh, what have said i mean you can't just take the same thing and just ram it around the whole world it is uh, it's very difficult to do that so over to that's you. yeah i would also like to hear your views uh, vinith on this uh, i think it's an interesting analogy here of the shock but of the buddhist and the christian model i mean you can't be rigid you can't uh, uh be extremely watertight saying that this is what i have and i'll take it to every country and because if you do in the current regime uh you have different tax regimes you have uh, different problems with every country associated with right now and i remember having this conversation with such months in many many years back and this is his first round of funding of flipkart had just happened and uh a lot of people this is entire conversation the vc world about the cut copy paste model that what is the innovation in india you're just bringing uh, what is happening in the us and bringing it to india the amazon of india so i posed him this question that uh, you are being called the amazon of india and a cut copy paste to which you replied that no i mean we have done innovation you know the big picture of innovation is actually in small things and one of the things that he that they did was to do cash on delivery because people in india were not comfortable doling out credit cards for an online transaction so they were the people to bring out credit cards so i think a lot of our thinking of innovation is confused with invention innovation lies in small things introducing cod for instance i mean you have a low cost carrier in india where there are women crew which dress up in like 5 minutes because they have to serve people i mean they have this entire dress like that uh, that is process innovation so there's innovation found in smaller things and uh, and i think there's huge merit to that uh, so to my question to you really is that being watertight in a model where solidarity is especially no more in a global environment that we are right now what does it really mean to be a global company and very important remark by mr shaw here that uh, you have got a global organization so perhaps uh, you can really share some thoughts here yeah you are on mute you are on mute vinit i said shirl can talk about religion i'll try and you know <laughs> not talk about that i i think two or three controversial remarks uh, number one we can be very happy in our house calling incremental innovation is innovation uh, every uh, every cook including me when i make omelet i can call it innovation and i can say that i i cook it better than my wife i cook it different to my wife and i can call it innovation uh, she doesn't agree but uh, i think we have to step back and answer the following question there are 1.3 1.4 billion indians can their aspirations be met within the four walls of india can just delivering innovation and delivering food and doing cash delivery and this and that is this going to convert more and more indians into uber drivers and 
you know, lowly paid, poorly managed, no HR, no insurance kind of people for mega rich founders? Or are we aspiring to create competitively companies which will dominate the global scale? So if you look at Korea transformation, if you look at China transformation, if you look at US domination, we should look at Germany domination. It only, they only dominated and created real wealth, not the market cap wealth, but cash. What is the, what is the true wealth of the company? The cash generated by the company and distributed to employees and shareholders. It is not market cap. So therefore, from a cash point of view, and if that is the company, there is no way but to think global. And if you do not have the aspiration of being global, then you will be always incremental in nature and all you will be doing is copy paste. I 100% agree in copy paste. I 100% agree there is a lot of copy paste happening. Now the question is, is globalization difficult? Of course it is difficult and that is the reason it is so interesting. If it was easy and if it was cookie cutter, as Cheryl rightly said, if there was one model of McDonald's which you could but do it across the globe. Everybody would do it. And that is the reason there is a difference between boys and boys and men or, or women and girls. And therefore, because of its complexity, because it needs innovation, it needs leadership, it needs talent, it needs multiculturalism, it needs uh, adaptability, it needs flexibility, the palm example which Anjali nicely gave. So you need you need that mindset, you need that product mindset, you need the service mindset, you need the people mindset, you need the global mindset. I would shudder to think of us celebrating domestic companies which who do not have global aspirations. Then you will completely get, get completely killed. I mean, you, there will be Corsairs of the world who will come to this country and replicate. There are Amazons of the world. So all that is already happening. We don't want the Pepsis and the Cokes to come into this country all over again. We want to go to their countries. And across the board, whether it is IT, whether it is pharma, whether it is product, whether it is aero, whether it is defense, electronics, whether it is any of this, we need to go global. So therefore, my answer to your question is, from a globalization point of view, India does not have a choice. Indian companies may have a choice. India does not have a choice. India has to go global because this country is too small for 1.4 billion people's aspiration. Number one. Number two, the, diff the increasing difficulty of going global is the attractive nature of the leadership challenge which we face. And India has some fantastic leaders. Anjali is rightly saying that there is this is a set of leaders which we are seeing today which are very adaptable, they are internationally educated, they are, they, you know, they have an aspiration which is bigger than the previous generation. So I would say we have no choice but to think global and we should not celebrate and we should not stop till every single 1.4 billion Indians gets, you know, 10 times more, 50 times more per, per capita income compared to what they're getting and that can only happen if more and more companies lead the way of going global. Yeah, that's an interesting conversation, perhaps a little dangerous one, where you mentioned we don't want the Pepsis and the Cokes of the world to come to India. We already have so many startup founders actually making a very strong case of protectionism, and one can actually understand and empathize with them where they're coming from. Of course, no, we don't I want to become I, another China. I, I'm, I'm, glad <laughs> you, I, I'm glad you pointed out. I am for bringing as much competition as you want in India. Absolutely, there should be no, nobody should be prevented from coming to India. And that should be the threat enough for the promoters to wake up to go global. So I'm, I stand corrected. You're right. Thanks for pointing that out. Can I just make one remark? Sure. I think the point about competition is a very important one. And honestly, if we step back and ask ourselves uh, the question, do we have real effective competition laws in India? I think you will uh, you'll be very sad at the answer that uh, that you will get because there is no real competition unless you have an effective market for change in corporate control. It is very difficult to take over a company in India as a hostile takeover. And until you have, like the US or in many other markets, an efficient, transparent market for corporate control, we will never have competition in India. India does, I mean, we have got a competition law, but we don't have competition compliance. 
it's a uh, we essentially still perpetuate monopolies it's well said uh what a lovely conversation today i think we just go on and on talking for leadership and culture i think my last question before we get into the rapid fire one quick answer from all of you that i have and i'll begin with you vinith get on to anjali and then mr shop what really is the culture of innovation in organization and how should a founder think about it amidst all the challenges and the opportunities that we spoke about i think it's a good last question to find the culture of innovation for your organization what should be the mental thinking models for a founder i'll begin with you get on to anjali and mr shah three words i don't know the tone the moment the founder accepts these three words i don't know the culture of innovation will start because then he will go and seek answers within the organization rather than get into the habit of telling the answers anjali i think continuous learning learn agility you have to keep pushing problem solving down in the organization versus it being delegated up which is the old model and listen okay. to the young people i think reverse mentoring is super critical and this is not just in sort of young founder led organizations who are still learning but the promoter led you know traditional companies okay mr shroff so i will use a different set of words for essentially what uh, we need said and i'll use it because i use it in my organization a lot it's i call it the culture of curiosity and it has to start at the top so even when our we internally we talk about it that our firm is built on four pillars and one of the pillars is uh, uh, innovation and we have a continuous uh, culture of curiosity it's such a nuts and other way of saying i don't know and the uh, and if you actually look at our firm you know letter head logo and other is called ahead of the curve uh, you see that on our uh, stationery as well because we made it a core value of the firm that you have always to be trying to be uh, looking one step ahead and that only comes with curiosity and humility both it has to start from the fact that i don't know it has to start from the fact that a lot of other people have better ideas than you and you have to have an open mind all the time uh, because if you if you don't innovate uh, i mean to use a cliche innovate or perish and it's so true and that's a great sum up to our conversation today i think it's time for some quick fun rapid fire and i will begin with the lady on the panel so i'll begin with you anjali a uh, one word that comes to your mind when i say the following startups and unicorn obsession shreeja i'm sorry the connection wasn't great startup and unicorn obsession Media has a big role to play. Oh come on! You can't blame us for this. Ce- I mean, don't ask me. Celebrate innovation, part. not valuation. Venture fraud. No, but celebrate Gen- innovation, like- not valuation. I hear, I see all the headlines talk about X, Y, Z valuation. <laughs> but we had the conversation today on operational excellence. Venture fraud. Till when will the cycle last? Sorry, who is this question for? For Anjali. Her screen is frozen, I think. Yeah, I think I think we've lost her. Yeah, I'll She's get on to you. She's not clear. Being... Would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, I think uh, I think your connection is unstable. Venture fraud. Would you mind repeating the question? The... Yeah, venture fraud. Till when will the cycle last? Uh, may it may it continue for a long time and may the music not end because nobody wants to be left holding it. <laughs> may the music not end. Nobody wants the party to end. I'll come on to you now, Vinit. Your all-time advice on leadership that you swear by. Let it go. Your take on the edtech phenomenon that we are seeing right now. Chewing gum bubble. Chewing gum bubble. That's what you call it, okay? Yeah. And why do you say so, that? I'm just curious. You don't believe uh, in this edtech of the world. You know, I uh, I say that the vacuum cleaner is the most bought, least used product in this country. 
because of fantastic uh, marketing campaign which Eureka Forbes did. Uh, EdTech companies uh, headed by uh, Mr. B is the most sold, most bought, least used. There is no proof of its uh, impact on learning outcome. There is no proof on how it helps uh, the child improve. And yet everybody is buying it because it is aspirational. So it's a, it's a chewing gum bubble. It's, it's going to burst. Nothing lasts forever unless it creates true value. And right now, I have not seen proof of true value. OK, it's a personal view. Uh, what differentiates a boss from a leader? Quick answer. Uh, a boss is dead. A leader has a chance. OK, if you were to quickly name three industries for the future, what would those be? Uh, pharma, uh, technology products, and shipbuilding. OK, and now I come on to you now, Mr. Shroff. We just heard Anjali and Vineen, I think, which have fared pretty well for their rapid fire. Let's see how do Is you there perform. A <laughs> there is no hamper, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, uh, some time back, some of my colleagues headlined <laughs> you uh, headlined you as the m &A king in this newspaper. Uh, my question to you, and it really is an interesting one, and uh, please be very candid on this one. One perennial problem that you have with Indian promoters for their mindset. What do you think? What would be your advice to them? Could be. So I Without generalizing, I mean, uh, not adjusted to the new reality. Okay. But, and you know, there's, one... there's a nuance over there. There is an intergenerational uh, difference also. So if I look at the, uh, the next generation, which has had mm -hmm. a sort of a different set of experiences, uh, they're different and they're less kind of emotionally attached uh, to uh, uh, to the sort of legacy. They, they look at it a bit more transactionally. So it's a nuanced answer. So basically, let it go. It's the difficult yeah, emotion. Yeah, for them. Right. OK. And one word that comes to your mind when I say startups and unicorn obsession. No, you can't repeat the same question. Give me another one. <laughs> That's done. <laughs> OK. A business leader whom you think has truly <laughs> built an, has truly built an anti-fragile business. Good one. I see there are many. I mean, I, I, it's hard to pick out any one. Uh, I think Uday Kotak is one, uh, for sure. Uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, it's uh, because I think he's also built I, it on a set of I agree. values. Wow, there's some unanimity on the panel now, but he's for one name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, well, again, there okay. are many. It's hard to pick out any one. Okay. Ninja, if you permit, then, I'm going to do a, a bit of a rapid fire with you. Uh, oh my God, that. with me? <laughs> no, you can't be doing that. <laughs> okay. Uh, my last I question. Push, yeah, I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back really hard because I think we are coming out of this. It we we don't have innovation in India, which I do not want to end this discussion with. I think there's plenty no, of innovation have, in we... India. If you look at what's happening in drone technology, in space tech, Absolutely. in climate tech. Yeah. In gene tech, there's a lot of stuff which you're not seeing today in, in the unicorn space. And unicorn is just, you know, it's a mythical animal. It's just a measure of valuation. If you look at value, there is so much innovation coming out of India in science. Uh, the biggest innovation that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world is in SPAC. Aadhaar, 1.3 billion people with biometric IDs, the ability to transact digitally with full trust is massive innovation. So let us not say we have a dearth of innovation in India. It looks different. And innovation always looks different everywhere else. Why should our innovation well, I'm, look like something that and comes I completely out of agree with you. I completely agree with you. That's what I said, that the big picture of innovation is in various things in India. And we see it in various aspects. In fact, just to tell you, I was in a fellowship recently. Uh, it was a financial services fellowship in London. And what India has done with UPI is a sinusure of all eyes. They are overawed with us mm -hmm. on what we have done. Mm -hmm. So there, so India is watching us in the fintech space. Uh, so there's so much that we have done here. It's incredible. So of course, the culture of innovation is strong. And to, to your point of what you mentioned, it might look different and come in different shapes, size, and forms. Uh, that's so pretty interesting. I can add to what Anjali said. Sure. There was yeah. a, a session I'd done with Amitabh Kant. And he actually called it that India can be the tech garage of the world. 
and that is its true potential yeah okay and i have my Absolutely. last question for all of you uh if you want to tell me what was the best part of the conversation today for all of you quickly like 30 seconds i'll begin with you vineet yeah yeah i, I mean your acknowledgement that we are all young <laughs> <laughs> on a serious note i was asking anyways anjali for what about you so i i would say that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I I I would say that the the, the emphasis on I think being to together a very very rich set of content questions. Okay. Yeah. And yes Mr. Shroff. No, I, yeah I I would sort of build a little bit on what Anjali said. I think the conversation was very deep. And uh, I think you uh, without fact I think you anchored it very well in terms of you made us all talk. Okay. Yeah. Great. So thank you. Thank you Anjali. Thank you me. Thank you Mr. Shraw for this amazing panel discussion. Thank you for audiences for being so patient. And the time I see you next goodbye and good luck. And stay thank safe. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank hi. Bye Vinny. Bye Anjali. Thank you.